and everyone. Welcome. I'm Barbara Peters from The Poison Pen. I know many of you are librarians. So once I was a librarian, university librarian, and a librarian at the Library of Congress. And for 31 years on Saturday, I've been the lucky owner of the Poison Pen Bookstore. But the greatest thing that's happened to me in 31 years, really, has been editing books for Poison Pen Press, acquiring and editing them. And one of the jewels in the crown is Bluff by Jane Stanton Hitchcock. Hi, Jane. Hi, Barbara. It's wonderful to be here. You're my jewel in my crown, if I have a crown. <laughs> Well, you do have a crown, and actually, I was going to talk about that because Jane is the author of any number of wonderful books, Trick of the Eye, The Witch's Hammer, Social Crimes, One Dangerous Lady, Mortal Friends, to name a few, and most recently, Bluff. Uh, Bluff is the winner this year of the Hammett Prize for Excellence in Mystery. But Jane has the distinction of having been nominated for a Hammett Prize back a while. Now, was that for Trick of the Eye, Jane? Yeah, 1992. Uh, the winner was Michael Connolly for Black Echo. And Ooh. looking back, I have to say, he deserved it. <laughs> well, certainly no disgrace to have lost to Michael Connolly. Exactly, so. exactly. It was best first novel of the year for both of us, right? He's got like 85 novels, all of which I've read, and I have six. <laughs> So it was, it was, it's phenomenal. It's a great, and also it's such a great, great looking award. Um, I, I'd love to show people what that award looks like. Well, I can see it behind you. Are you able to reach I can't, I can't, up? I can only see you. I can't see me. So here it is. I'm, uh, here. So it's, can you see what I'm doing? Cause I can't see what yes, I'm Yes, now it's fine. It's, it's actually, like the thin man, Dashiell Hammett himself it is the, was. It is a, Dashiell a thin Hammett man. with the head of the Maltese Falcon. I love it. Or his two favorite, you know, well, you know, uh, cloud crowd freezing uh, uh, books, and it's just the coolest award. And it looks like a, a statue I had to sell <laughs> years ago. Well, if you've read Bluff, you know that it's my story, and this looks like a Giacometti that I had to sell after my family was looted. If, you, if you've read Bluff, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. Well, one I want to I I make it clear that I'd rather have the Hammett than anything. One of the unfortunate effects of the pandemic is that the ceremony for the Hammett Award, which is really going to be very cool, uh, was canceled. So what was it going to be for you to accept this wonderful award? Well, I was told that we were going to go to Dashiell Hammett's old apartment somewhere, I'm not sure, and that Eddie Muller of uh, Noir Alley on Turner Classics Movies was going to give me that award. Now, I watch Noir Alley every single week, as I'm sure most people do, but it was kind of like a dream, and it remains a dream. <laughs> but it would have been cool. It would have been cool. It would have been very cool. So I'm going to take a minute for those of you who may not be familiar with the award structure and just run through it for um, books, mostly books just pub published in the English language. In America, the Mystery Writers of America, their best book and best first novel awards are called the Edgars after Edgar Allan Poe. The Thriller Writers have their own award system called the Thriller Awards. And one of the reasons I'm mentioning it, where'd we all go? I don't know. I've done something with the, with the. I've clicked on something because I couldn't see anything. Sorry. I don't know what I've done. Sourcebooks webinar. Please come back. Sorry. Mm -hmm. What do I click on, guys? Uh -oh. Well, we're over in a in a side column, and there's something else on the screen. But unfortunately, I have no idea how to fix it. I don't know how to fix this. Well, I guess screen sharing. Uh, participants. Wait a minute. I'll bet, I'll bet we could go back to, now that's hide self view. There must be a full screen somewhere in there. Uh, guys, where are you guys? Saucebook webinar. Uh, sorry. I think I'm just going to have to log in again or something or stop share. Oh, here we go. Oh, there we are. How's that? Good. Better. Yeah. I'm sorry. Right. So sorry. Okay. I'm a Luddite. I'm old. 
just don't touch anything and we'll no, be, no, I won't. be okay. Yeah. All right. So as I was saying, um, one of the reasons that these awards, the mystery writers and the thriller writers, and I'll carry on to the others, are prestigious is that they are juried awards. They are judged by, um, generally by other writers, so like a jury of your peers, as opposed to fan awards. Many of you in library world may be familiar with like the Agathas and the Anthonys and so forth, um, but those are fan-based. Anyway, um, in Britain, they're called the Dagger Awards. They're presented by the Crime Writers Association, Gold Dagger, other kinds. And the Diamond Dagger, which Cartier sponsors this year, goes to a source books author, Martin Edwards, who is a wonderful writer, and uh, has a new book out called Martin Mort Main Hall. Uh, in Canada, the awards are called the Arthur Ellis Awards. I really love these because they're named after Canada's hangman. It's his pseudonym. And until recently, the award was actually a scaffolding with a little author hanging so off it. But I'm told by Alan Bradley, who won it, uh, the Flavia Deleuze author, that they have changed the award. If we move to Australia, it is the Ned Kelly Award, and that's named after a famous outlaw. And New Zealand has the Nio Marsh Award. So all of those are given by people in their own country, but the Hammond Award, and the reason it's so cool and such an honor for Jane, the Hammond Award is an international award. It's not tied to a country. And um, for that reason, it's most coveted. So Jane, warmest congratulations. Thank it's an honor you thank really you. deserved. It was a real honor for me. And thank you, Barbara, for publishing this book. Thank you. Well, let's talk a little bit about, um, you know, the old question we often get, where your ideas come from. Um, and in this case, in this case, this is a very personal story. And I don't know how much you want to go into your family story, but why don't we talk a bit about how the family drama prompted you to become a poker player, which is one of the reasons that Bluff is structured like a poker hand and is actually called Bluff. Well, uh, when uh, my family was swindled out of an enormous millions and millions of dollars by an accountant, a trusted accountant. Uh, and then my m mom, my dear mom died. Uh, and I was instrumental actually in putting him in jail, but I couldn't concentrate on anything. And so I began playing online poker, poker stars. And I, it, I played for fake chips and it seemed really easy, you know, uh, because there I was, I was making a lot of money on fake chips, but online, I wasn't an old bat in fuzzy slippers. Online, I was Buffalo Bill 389, about 25 years old, out of work, mad, bad, and dangerous to play with. I was just online, I was a totally different persona. And then online poker was, uh, I, I started to play for money. I did really well. In fact, my husband's right here and I used to go, he said, what are you doing going to the Safeway so, so much? And I said, oh, there are sales there. And he said, really? And uh, actually I was wiring money to Costa Rica to play poker, right? Which he finally sussed out, but anyway. So on, I was playing tournaments and online poker, I, I sat down to play a tournament and online poker was absolutely forbidden that day. It said the United States Treasury has shut down your site. So I couldn't play online anymore. And a year later, after a grand depression, that was in 2011, I ran into a friend of mine on the street and she said, listen, I know uh, a poker game that my husband has, would you like to join? And I said, well, yes, but I'd never played live poker before. So that night I dressed in like a leather jacket. I thought I'll be very cool. You know, how do I, I'm gonna face, uh, for the first time I'm gonna face real people and they were gonna see me as I really am. You know, an older woman, what? You know, playing poker. So I go there and I play the session and afterwards a really great guy came up to me, a lawyer, and he said, listen, he said, you don't know what you're doing but you have great card sense. He said, I'll give you three lessons and hold them and uh, you'll know what you're doing. And uh, two months later, I beat him in a tournament and that started the path downwards. And I started going to all these tournaments and I realized 
that I wanted to tell my family's story, but I didn't want to tell it with any kind of self-pity because uh, there's just nothing worse. Uh, and, and, and being a mystery writer, I thought, could I meld, could I meld my family story into like a poker hand where you don't quite know what you're seeing until the, the hand is unraveling? It's like poker. You don't know until the next card is dealt what the hand is going to mean. Because in the end, my family story was about money and betrayal. But as my stepfather used to say, anything you can buy with money is cheap. And I learned so much playing poker uh, about older women being invisible at the table, using my invisibility to make me invincible. I have had poker pros say to me, if I look like you, I could win the World Series three times over. Because people who are underestimated are always underestimated at, the, at, at their own, at the person's own peril. Because being a woman and in a poker world, I was an older, I was always underestimated. And then I, if you look back here, I don't know whether you can see it, but there's me winning my first championship at the first 2017 uh, Potomac Poker Open. That's really an awesome story, Jane. Well, so basically what we have here is your mom, who was something of a celebrity, married quite a rich man. And uh, yeah. when he died, various problems ensued, which we won't go into, but it did cause a financial crisis. So your right. book, translating that, um, you have this wonderful woman who has been beggared, essentially, and how, I guess we'd call it a revenge thriller. Do you think that's a fair description? A uh, avenging angel, did you say? What did you no, say? <laughs> a, well, okay. A revenge thriller, which I think, you know, fairly sums up the story. But you're right that Mon is able to don a, a cloak of invisibility because she's older and she's right. not very glamorously dressed anymore, although she does her best to sort of pull together her the best outfit she's got in order to arrive at the scene, uh, which turns into the crime scene. Um, did you see you or your mom as Maud when you wrote that? Well, my mother was uh, Lois Lane on radio. So I grew up with Superman and the superheroes. I, I wanted to avenge my mother, uh, but I mainly, wanted to avenge myself because I had placed so much trust in this guy. And um, I also wanted to show something about money uh, because money is in many ways an overrated wish. Money exaggerates who you are. If you're good, you'll be better. And if you're bad, you'll jump right down on the devil's trampoline. In my own household, which was very dysfunctional, money did nothing to help us along. In fact, uh, I, I share this very sadly, but I have two brothers who died of drug addiction and money seemed to attract uh, the, the villain of the story to the family. It insulated us from what was really true. And I always wanna say to people, you know, when you see rich people or celebrities smiling, and, you know, it's not all that it seems. And uh, the people who have money are often more competitive than the Olympians, more miserable than anybody I've ever met. And I grew up with a lot of that. And I saw it and it's been my, my dream to sort of um, make the reader complicitous with the heroine who is going to kill or frame. Uh, I think if the reader, uh, is says, yes, we want you to do that. I think I've done my job. Um, I also think mystery writers are incredibly smart. And I always like to give a little twist that you didn't expect. And I hope it worked in Bluff. Uh, people have told me that it works. Uh, and, and I just hope people really, really liked it. That's all, yeah. Well, I certainly loved it. It was such a pleasure to work in. And I didn't mention um, that when it published in hardcover in April of 2019, Publishers Weekly made it one of their 10 best mysteries uh, for the spring, which is really a, a lovely honor as well. 
I think the twist is fabulous, but I think that the issues you address, um, women power, you know, how to take things back, is probably as much of a hook as the actual plot. So just to open it up, what happens? Maude gets all dressed up and goes out to lunch and things don't go quite the way she expected. Well, she gets dressed up as she would have, uh, as, as a sort of uh, the socialite that she once was. And she goes to the Four Seasons, which was uh, the most powerful restaurant in the most powerful city in the world in 2014. And uh, she has, you know, she's intent on shooting, uh, uh, on shooting someone. You really don't know who it was. And she shoots someone and it turns out that she, everybody thinks she has shot the wrong person because her nemesis is sitting there with the one of the most powerful men in the country and she has shot him rather than her nemesis because actually her nemesis when he saw her coming he pulled his friend in front of him and so she shoots the wrong guy and then she gets on a train she's able to walk out of the restaurant because she is who she is she's an older woman and i say in the book you know if an African American or a Hispanic man or any really, you know, dicey looking person had walked into that restaurant, they would have been tackled before they hit the, the table. But, you know, our, our, our preconceptions about people are so false that this very prim socialite was able just to go in there, shoot someone and walk out. And she gets on a train, she goes back to Washington, and then she goes underground in the poker world a world in which I have played. I played underground poker in DC. I played in the last illegal poker game in DC until it was held up by gunpoint. I mean, I, I, I have pictures of it. And, you know, I became addicted to, to the, the game. And, and I, I just thought it would be really fun for readers to see what the world of poker is really like. And also in, in playing poker, with people who had, you know, felony convictions and everything else, I met a world of wonderful, wonderful people, to be honest. People who were much truer to their word than a lot of my social friends who actually in real life wouldn't speak to me when I was Cassandra, this is real life me now, Jane, in New York, telling everybody that this guy was a fraud and a thief. And my social friends, because he had so many famous clients. I mean, he had clients whose names, you know, Lauren Bacall, Neil Simon, Mike Nichols. I mean, he had the Barbara Walters. People were afraid of this guy. And I kept saying, wait a minute, he's doing to my mother something really terrible. I went to the DA in secret. But in any case, they deserted me. My poker friends did not. I made some incredibly great friends uh, who, I still have to this day, but it was an eye opener for me because I never would have met these people if I hadn't played poker. And I had, you just have to take people as they come, not as any preconceived notion of them. Well, we wouldn't have bluff if all of this hadn't happened. So I'm sorry that you went through it, but I have to I'm say not, that. I'm not, it's called life, darling. I could have oh. gone through much worse and people have and people are. And that must be recognized today, particularly in this pandemic. People are going through hell. So what I went through is nothing compared to what many, many people are going through in the world. And, um, you know, my heart goes out to them. I know what losing people means. It's very, very tough. Jane, we need to do a game of bluff trivia, which seems trivial after what you just said, but nonetheless, oh, that's what I we're doing like, here. I like trivia. Um, so, um, this is time for our first bluff activity. We're going to play a game called Truth or Bluff. A question about bluff uh, will be displayed on the screen. In fact, there it is. After reading the question, you who are watching have to decide if the trait statement is true or if it's false, i.e., is it a bluff? Remember, each time you participate in the activity or ask a question in the Q&A section, you will be entered in to win a Poison Pen Press mystery prize pack. And there are a couple of trivia questions over on the screen on the side, but let's see what happens here, how everybody votes 
Uh, the villain of the novel, Blurt, Bert Sklar, is he based on a real life accountant and money manager who was convicted of running a postal a Ponzi scheme worth millions, robbing, robbing numerous wealthy and celebrity clients. Um, I think we actually kind of answered that. I think, think we kind of answered, unless you think I was bluffing. Well, and maybe you were, so <laughs> we'll find was. out. Um, while we're letting people answer the question, we have one or two that have come in. Uh, do you have a favorite place to write, Jane? Well, I'm kind of in it. Can I get this off my screen right here? I guess I can. Yeah. Um, I'm in it. I'm in my office uh, with my husband and my dog, actually. They're here. And uh, my dog is acknowledged in the book as a little heartbeat at my feet, Miss, Miss Chloe. Um, I, I like writing in the office. I think it's important, you know, for people who want to be writers, I think it's important to have a space where you can go. And even if you just go stare at the page for a half an hour, it's good. But a dear friend of mine said, just write for 10 minutes a day, you know, and it, it's funny, then your muse kind of comes to you and uh, you'd be surprised what happens. I mean, particularly I think in these times which are very anxious, people want to get their stories out and just sitting down and writing almost anything is very helpful. It certainly has helped me in life. Well, I've been a guest in your home and I thought there was a possibility that um, you would mention your fabulous indoor swimming pool area as a famous as a place to write, but I can see that that would be <laughs> distracting. So it appears that most people were able to answer the question correctly. Yes, well, most people were listening, actually. <laughs> sorry about that, um, but there I'm we are. Sorry, I gave it away. <laughs> um, another question then um, that we should discuss is how, how are attorneys characterized in your book? Stereotypical, two-dimensional? Do you think that um, do you think that your portrait was a, a real one or was it just this is the people you ran into, which may not be representative of the entire legal community? I've run into both of the people who are attorneys in that book and it wasn't my, the finest hour for them. Uh, I think attorneys, you know, some are great. It's like people, some are great, some are not. I mean, Shakespeare said, kill all the lawyers. Who am I to argue with Shakespeare? But, um, uh, you know, in the book, uh, yeah, Mona Lickle, who is the female attorney for uh, Sklar, is based on a real person, absolutely. And Squire Huff, who is the attorney for Jean, uh, he's based on an attorney I knew, uh, kind of stuffy, nice, clubby attorney, yeah. It just depends. If you're winning the lawsuit, I guess they're great. If you're losing it, not so great. <laughs> but they're certainly taking up a lot of American time now. I hear that people, I hear that the divorce lawyers have, have you know, tripled their business along with Amazon, right? If only Jeff Bezos could get divorce lawyers to, uh, on Amazon, I think he would have another bonanza because people are in the pandemic are just, <laughs> it's lawyer central. People are just yeah. who they really are. I'm, a, I'm one of the very few people still living who actually read the law. I didn't go to law school. I read the law, which you were allowed to do in Virginia. And I can only practice law in Virginia because since I didn't go to law school, I can't take the bar exam in Arizona, which is one reason we have the Poison Pen Bookstore and I am not engaged in law practice. But I do think that lawyers are, uh, through their training, are are able to, to do long-term thinking and project um, consequences in a way, if this, then that, which makes them very successful in business. But the truth is it may also make them very successful in criminal enterprise and cons, who knows? Um, so like we can, sorry? Like accountants. You know, a good accountant can figure out how to help you or help himself or herself. Absolutely true. So in answer to the question, the villain Bert Sklar, based on a real life villain who pilfered millions of dollars from his celebrity clients, that is indeed true. Um, and you, you actually played a role in getting him convicted, as you've already mentioned. You made a secret 
trip to the DA's office. Oh, I went, then, uh, yeah, I went to the DA in secret and they really couldn't do anything until, uh, you know, we, my mother, I finally got my mother to uh, sue him and there was a settlement, uh, not for very much. And then of course, when he, when the pig, piggy bank of my mother and uh, another rather famous, very famous woman, a uh, very rich woman, when, when their piggy banks dried up, he had to actually start stealing from somebody. He stole from a celebrity and he was arrested. And at that point, uh, the, the New York Southern District was able to get him because I only went to the Manhattan District Attorney and really the, the Southern District is able to go to the federally. And so they were able to access the banking records. But the way that I got him was in our lawsuit, we were able to point out how he did certain things. And they could use that as kind of a guide as to how he managed to, it was a, it was a Ponzi scheme. Well, for those of you who are really interested in this story, you can Google it um, because there is quite a lot of information yeah. online, lots of news articles and so forth. And, and it would enrich your reading of Bluff to know the real story behind it, although the book certainly stands on its own. I hope uh, so. Yeah. And it, it's a lot of fun to read despite the you know terrible things that are going on. Jane wrote it in such a way that it's really um, fast paced and I think um, delightful and lots of humor in it. And you can tell from listening to Jane that her sense of humor has remained undimmed despite all these trials. So I do have some librarian questions, Jane, um, from Marion County Public Library in Florida. We've already covered this. They asked, you must enjoy poker. How is your personal game? And how do you take it from a game of chance to a game of skill? So we maybe didn't cover the game of chance to game of skill. Or though maybe you did because you said that somebody helped you that you know you played a few sessions with him and um and you well, learned well first of all can i just say something to all librarians who are listening right here uh you are the keepers of the flame my personal her heroes and heroines thank you very much for the work that you do and for the the, the books that you got you know watch over um skill and chance meet in poker. Uh, poker's gotten a lot more sophisticated. Uh, there's game theory now. I'm, I was just on a poker broadcast with a guy who does nothing but cerebral uh, game theory, Andrew Brokos. He's absolutely brilliant. He does a great uh, podcast. Uh, me, for me, I, to, I need the cards. I say cards rule. But I think if you are a, you know, a professional like Eric Seidel or somebody like that, you are playing game theory and your edge goes up if you, if you don't play necessarily uh, by chance every time. You're, there's a certain skill in figuring out the odds to every hand. If you play like that, you're going to be a little bit ahead. And then you can have wild runs of chance, which is like the, you know, the guy who wins the World Series of Poker. You need so much luck to win the World Series of Poker. Timing is everything as we are learning in this pandemic um, yeah. all the way around. From Rolling Hills Consolidated Library District in Montana, how was it developing female characters of a certain age doing things not normally expected, like murder? Is there a freedom in putting the crime out in front and not keeping it secret? And I, I'm assuming that question really means to the structure of a mystery story. You know, if you start with the crime and we know who did it, that's different than uh, an investigation where a crime has taken place and the whole point of the book is to figure out who did it. Well, my other book, Social Crimes, uh, which also has a female heroine, heroine who is a murderer, uh, the first line of social crimes is murder was never my goal in life. I, I kind of like, <laughs> I, I like, when I was a kid, I read a lot of Edith Wharton. And I remember sitting sobbing over Lily Bart in the, in the House of Mirth. I was just so sad about Lily uh, because she was a prisoner of her circumstance. And I said, then as I got older, I became very impatient with women who just decided they were going to accept their fates and take laudanum and die. I thought there's a better solution here, which is to accept your fate, go out and kill someone. That, 
I mean, you know, revenge is sweet. It's not fattening. I, I, <laughs> this is this is my entire credo. And in fact, um, uh, Jim Mattis, who General Mattis, has a saying that I live by. You know, be polite, be professional, and have a plan to kill everybody you meet. And I think in fiction, that's my, that's my thing. I, I write, I'm professional, and I have a plan to kill someone in my books. <laughs> that's my plan. Probably safer to do it in books than real life. Well, so yeah, I good. had a choice, right? Absolutely. Okay, Central City Library in Nebraska would like to know, what is an example of something that you edited out of this book? that would have affected the story in a significant way. And I should say before you answer that, that actually after I accepted this book, after I acquired it, there was a whole rewrite that we did. And so the book we published is not the book that I originally acquired. That's exactly right. Oh, how much did I, my husband is sitting here. He kept saying, cut, cut, cut. But I'll tell the story of how it got rewritten. Uh, Barbara, very kindly accepted my book. I was so thrilled. Uh, but she and I, despite her brilliant suggestion and everything, she and I kind of knew that it wasn't where it needed to be. I'm not even sure that you didn't even get the whole first person version. I mean, there were, there were 19 drafts of this book. For anybody who thinks that writing is easy, forget it. Uh, Barbara accepted a version that I, you know, finally had done, and every so I, I go up to a tournament, a poker tournament at Borgata, which is a casino in Atlantic City, and I'm playing this tournament, and I'm winning against it's a it's a big tournament, it's expensive buy-in, and I'm winning, and I blow it in one hand, and I'm so upset that I get in the car, I forget half the stuff there, I go home, and for four days. I do not eat, I do not sleep. My husband is standing over me with like coffee and you know, saying cut, cut, cut. I rewrote the whole book in four days because I knew the material so, so very well. So for this questioner, did I discard stuff? Almost everything. The scene with, uh, you know, it, where she goes on television, that was a whole different scene. I mean, almost every scene was different. But when you know your material so well, and you're given a shot by someone like Barbara to really make it better, and uh, it, you, you and some catastrophic thing leads you to only being able to write, which I think it catapulted me back to my childhood, where I misery made me able to write. Misery made me write rewrite that book. I was just miserable about that tournament, but it turned out okay. It did turn out okay, and you've made an excellent point, which is that the book that published is very often not the book that was originally submitted. Right. Um, it's, it's a long, complicated process to edit a book. It's a collaborative process, and the result, the final result, is what one hopes is the best result that can be achieved between, in, in this dialogue between two people. But the other thing you also have to recognize, there's a utility principle here, as an editor, which is at some point, and the author has to recognize it too, at some point you really do have to let a book go. Mm -hmm. You're not published until you're published. And so, you know, it, it's often difficult to judge the point at which the editing or the revising process needs to come to an end and the book is the best it can be for that moment. But um, it is, I, yeah, but it, it's also important, I think, to have someone who has faith in, in you. And that's a wonderful, wonderful thing. My husband was reading, I can't believe he would read every single draft. And then you had faith in me. And that that's important. I mean, you don't always get a Barbara Peters having faith in you for sure. But somebody in your life who can read and give you feedback is, is, is essential. Or it's very nice. <laughs> well, Jane, you were a joy to work with and I'm very proud of you and the result, and you know, clearly has been validated by various things we've already talked about. Now, there is a second question, which I don't lose it here. Here we go. Um, we told you earlier that Jane, Hatch, that Jane is an avid poker player, but what we didn't tell you is that she's also a skilled gardener, has won awards on her synchronized swimming team, and is a world-class sommelier one of only 172 professionals 
who have earned the title Master Sommelier, which is kind of a nice way of saying she knows a lot about wine. So here again, uh, is this true or is this fluff? Now, Jane, while they are deciding on the answer to that in pursuit of prizes, <clears throat> let's go back. And there was another question from a library. Uh, Redland Community Library in Pennsylvania and Adams County Library in Wisconsin. Jane, you said in your video that some of the story reflects your own life. Um, and I think we've pretty much answered this. Um, and they've said they love the poker section. So let me, let me flip over here to a comment from you, which I think you might like to hear. I really like the book. The heroine is very spiritual. Actually, the whole book is. I found it very philosophical, very well written, love the twist and the writing style. Wow. So that's a nice, a nice comment for you. You said it. <laughs> Thank you, whoever said that. Um, and another comment from my Catherine Healy is the cover is beautiful, very Audrey Hepburn-esque. Can you shed light on how it came about? And I agree. I think it's a wonderful cover. That is Poison Pen's Leonardo da Vinci, Holly. She made a cover that I could have published a phone book with that cover and people would have bought it. It's a great cover. Um, thank you for recognizing that. When Holly gave me that cover, I mean, she really deserves, I think, half the credit <laughs> for the sales of, these, of this book. She, she's a genius. She was just, she, it was everything I dreamed, you know? It, it was amazing. But that, that's not me, that's, that's her. Um, so Barbara employs her and give her a raise, Barbara. Big, big raise. Well, sadly, I am no longer her employer, but I definitely think Find that she <laughs> excelled herself um, in, in that cover, and it was oh, indeed perfect really? for the package. Really? Um, another question that has come in is, do you have a favorite book or books that you might like to share? Um, well, you know, I have lots of favorite books. I mean, I have some really favorite writers, you know, uh, Ruth Rendell, uh, Patricia Highsmith, Edgar Allan Poe. I'm afraid that I'm, you know, I, I like the classics a lot. I read a lot of Trollope. I read, you know, I'm, I'm just like so not of my time. It's so sick. But um, I love a very, very, very good story, which is, um, I, I love being lost in a novel. Um, there are great novels being written today for sure. Um, but I, I just tend to love the, the mystery novels that, uh, of, of your, I love, look, I love a lot of mystery. I mean, Michael Connelly is always great. I always usually, usually try to read the great mysteries that come out today and some of which I love and some of which, you know, uh, I forget, but um, I, I like the classics. What can I say? Yeah. Well, I think the point there is that um, authors who write well, read well. Now we have the uh, results of the poll, 85% um, of those responding felt that that description of you as a gardener synchronized swimmer and world-class sommelier was all a bluff. So, so was is that lie. indeed true? I swim while drinking wine in my garden. No, I'm, it's a bluff. <laughs> of course it's a bluff, yes. That was definitely a bluff. Yeah. All right, now I have another question, um, all in caps, so this is a big question. Okay. Hello, Jane from Source from source books, I think. Um, somebody has said, I adored Bluff and I want to ask, what is the uh, most audacious Bluff you've ever made and what was the outcome? Are we talking about in life or in poker? I'm assuming in life. Mm. Uh, in life, I would say my most audacious Bluff was in standing up to the accountant who swindled my mother uh, and saying I was going to get him. I did get him, but at the time I didn't know I was going to get him. So I would say that's, a, that's an audacious bluff. Excellent uh, answer. Now, Christy St. John says she loved the book, especially having older women become so empowered. She likes the wicked sense of humor and delightful twists, twists 
and I've recommended it to all my friends and book clubs. So there's another really nice takeaway for wow. you. Wow, thank you so much. You know, we older women, um, we old bats, I, I'm an old bat, uh, we're always underestimated. It's just, in, it's just extraordinary. And, and I think playing poker really hit home, that hit home for me, that people just, they didn't even see me. I say in the, in the book, you know, older women are invisible and we don't even have to disappear. Uh, and I think lately now people are really coming to terms with how um, important women are uh, of any age, any age, and, you know, and maybe as we get older and wiser and we've seen it all 85 times, uh, maybe, <laughs> maybe we're even more valuable at this moment. I certainly, I think we are in the pandemic, you know, so many healthcare workers and, you know, um, wives and moms and everything are, are really holding this country together right now. I'm going to address something that you and I have talked about, which is, you know, this invisibility that can um, overcome women as they grow old. And I remember distinctly when I was in my mid forties, I was in New York with my beautiful daughter who's 18 years old and we were walking along and there was a moment in which I recognized that I was a mere pane of glass and that every comment and look was not at me, but was directed at, at Susan. And it was a, you know, gave me a bit of a jolt, but then I thought, hey, wonderful, you know, because it's a new generation coming up. And so I kind of put aside any thought of myself as particularly visible. Then I opened a bookstore and then I got older. And what I've learned is the real advantage to getting older that is hard to do when you're, when you're young is that you can have, always have women, but you can now have men as friends. And you know, over 31 years, I can't begin to count the number of men, married, divorced, single, gay, doesn't really matter that have become really good friends. And I find that to be a real plus at, at this end of my life, because I'm going to be 80, as you know, in a couple of months. And, you know. Well, 12, Barbara. Seriously. No, 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 sadly. No. Um, it's going to be my last birthday ever. I'm going to be the Jack Benny of the book selling trade, you know, and never have another <laughs> birthday. But my point is that, you know, there is a period, I think, in middle age to find maybe now middle age seems to run up to your 70 or something, where maybe you do feel invisible. But I have found once I got to be 70, or in my case, maybe 65, that that went away. And I feel even more visible now than I you do are visible. when I was I young. Mean, yeah, I mean, you are visible for a number of reasons. Uh, your, your whole persona is so famous. You're like a queen. So that makes you visible right there. You're ageless, Don, ageless. But in terms of being invisible, uh, growing invisible, you're the rare mother who uh, actually, I, I have no frame of reference there. My mother never gave up the crown of wanting to be oh. <laughs> visible. I mean, she was like, uh, she was gonna be the prom girl forever. And um, so your daughter's probably well, very well adjusted. <laughs> That's all I can say. So another question has come up. Um, do you think that mystery writers share some personality traits? In other words, do you have some in common? And what makes a great mystery writer? I've already said that I think one of the distinguishing traits is that most great writers are also great readers, avid readers. But what would you add to that? Uh, I, I think we all have deep uh, issues in our childhood, actually. I mean, the impulse to commit murder on a page didn't just arise from, oh, gee, I want to write a bestseller. That's not how it comes, or, or you know, a real one. Uh, it, it, it's, it's issues. To be a writer, right, you know, writing, it, it, you don't choose it, it chooses you. And if it chooses you in a way that you're doing away with people, I mean, that is something very deep in you. I, I mean, I, I could have written cookbooks. I could have written, you know, lovely stories about growing up in New York. Did I? No. I mean, I, there's a real kind of, look, poker's the same way. You, 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 poker's war. I mean, and, and, and writing, in a sense, is war. And I just happened to go to, 
battle in both of those, knowing that someone is going to die <laughs> in print. In print, that's the key. So yeah. I have a question, which is, you are married to a Pulitzer Prize winning foreign correspondent and columnist for the Washington Post, a lovely man who I've enjoyed having dinner with and visiting and so forth. So do you find that your different writing lives, do they run parallel or do they coincide? Do you affect each other? I mean, you're both, you're two writers living in a household with a dog and not match up their company at the moment. So um, how is that Dog is working? not writing because she can't stand the silences. <laughs> no, she's, um, yeah, I mean, first of all, Jim's won two Pulitzers, but you know, he's a journalist. So he thinks about writing in an entirely different way than I do. Uh, you know, I'm writing novels is very different from daily journalism, but what is fantastic is that he understands me to my soul, to the inner workings of my soul. He, when I'm at the depth of depression, he said, you're working, you're just working, just keep on working. He is my biggest sort of cheerleader. And uh, when he was writing a column, I, I, we made a space for him in the attic so that he would be completely uh, insulated because I understood what it meant for him to have the daily grind of having to get out a column. And, you know, I, 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 you understand the silences, you understand the preoccupation with uh, apparent trivia or whatever, um, the moods. Very often I say I married Jim because he doesn't make me eat with him. I don't have to have a meal with him if I don't want to. Uh, you know, writers are moody. If you're working on something, you, you kind of want to be in your own space. So it's worked out really brilliantly uh, for me. I've been extremely, extremely lucky. But it's a second marriage. <laughs> OK, need I say more? Uh, no, I'm actually coming up on 30 years with my husband, who is not my first husband. And indeed, we've learned to be kind to each other and to apologize you know, in ways that when we were young, we both agreed that if we'd married young, we'd have killed each other. But in our mature years, we've learned how to manage, which I think is a very important thing. Well, who was wonderful too. I mean, when we had dinner together with you, it was so great. I mean, look, writers are just impossible. We're a, we're a moody crew. Um, um, yeah, I think that's true because you're spending so much time with imaginary friends. And, you know, and you're in your head. And that's um, another thing. You're always, that's a very good point, because no matter what you're doing, you, you're never quite in what you're doing if you're writing. Like, I'm writing a book right now, or trying to write I've three books, because I've kind of been a little distracted, but going back on stuff that I had written. But it's, it's always in your mind. You're always, like, gathering information. And sometimes you, you don't even know you're gathering it. But your mind is always set of what can I use here? What can I use? Uh, very often people use friendships they shouldn't use because, you know, that's what they know. Truman Capote famously used a friendship and it broke it up. I mean, writers are, are very carnivorous beings and very vamp vampiric, you know. I, I say I'm a vampire. <laughs> I think novelistic could also apply. I'm trying to remember what author... What author's wife said to me once that, you know, in all the years she'd been married to her husband, they'd never had dinner alone because he always brought, you know, to the table all of his imaginary friends who shifted. So we have another question. Um, why did Sunderland, when he saw Maud coming towards his table, say, Lois, we killed you? Well, because as you find out in the book, uh, they did kill her mother and she looks like her mother in middle age. So he's looking like he sees the ghost of Lois Warner, the woman that he knows he killed, that he's been horribly guilty about for all these years because he's riddled with Catholic guilt uh, about having abetted, abetted a murder. And so when he sees this incarnation of you know, of the woman that he killed coming towards him, he thinks it's a ghost. So, and in fact, Maud says, uh, you know, I must look a lot more like my mother than I thought, <laughs> but in middle age, she probably did. Very, very true. So you touched on the fact that you um, are working on something. Is it, is it, 
ready to share or is this just batting around in your head and it's too early to talk about it? Well, it's just, it's only interesting for people who want to write that I've been trying to write this thing for 10 years and it has like 95 million pages. I mean, it's like the congressional record. It's got so many pages and it's trying, I have three books and I thought, well, I mailed them. It's like kind of like bluff, you know, it just took me nine years to figure out how to do it. And I keep waiting to what I call catch fire with one of these ideas. Uh, you know, I have a COVID idea that I think is fun, fun, which you will probably read all of them. So I, I don't want to spoil your fun, Barbara. <laughs> no, I didn't want you to either. Let me just say that I have read all of Jane's books. I love Social Crimes, which is in many ways similar to Bluff and takes place in New York and New York society and um, is a lot of fun. But at this moment in life, I think that Mortal Friends, where Jane really takes down the Washington DC social scene and power structure is, is fabulous. Um, it's it's well worth reading. Um, so while she's working on a new book, find a copy of Social Crimes in your library, find a copy of Mortal Friends, and you will find the same voice and the same wonderful characters um, from Jane's imagination, not Maud, but, but others that you will really like. Um, is there anything that you're reading right now that you would recommend? Well, I'm trying to, you asked what I was working on. Um, so I'm, well, the, the tentative title of one of my books is The Ghost Wife. So I've been reading a lot of ghost stories. Um, and, and that's been fun because I, I, I never really read ghost stories. But the other day I alighted on the story that I think sums up the pandemic. And that is, uh, the Mask of Red Death by Edgar Allan Poe. If you want to read about this pandemic, read that. It's a short story. It is so brilliant. And it is about, uh, it's about a party, <laughs> a masquerade party, and it is absolutely brilliant. The Mask of Red Death, Edgar Allan Poe. Let me give a nod to my truly favorite author, because in terms of mystery, Poe wrote about the soul of mystery. And all the fears that we have within us. He's still the, the, the champion. He is a wonderful writer. He's Auguste Dupin. Short stories are generally, they're if not the foundation of mystery, certainly in the very beginning of it are, are crucial to how mystery developed. Before we sign off, um, we talked to, to Jane about her husband, James, Jim Hoagland. And if you're interested in meeting Jim and learning things about Jim, Jim and I are doing an event on October 15th uh, on the Poison Pen website uh, with a man who's written A Wonderful Life of John McCain. And both of us are looking forward to it. So if you have questions for Jim or you'd like to, Chloe. Read, so to speak, you can join us then. So can I introduce people to Chloe? You can, by all means. Can you pick, pick Chloe up? Chloe? Okay. This is my little alien from the planet Adorable. This is Chloe. Yes. Hi, Chloe. You are adorable. Absolutely. So um, I, I have- I promised her her cameo. You know, she would have been impossible if I hadn't given it to her. What a star. <laughs> well, Jane, it's always an absolute delight to visit with you. And I want to thank everyone who joined us this evening.